Hey everybody, I'm Jack Reed with Future Pastimes, and this is Battle Language, and I'm here with Jaded, and we're going to have a discussion about some common uh, mistakes, misunderstandings, and uh, things that you might not be completely clear on when you're first playing Dune, or if you haven't played in a while, or, or maybe you've been doing it wrong all along, and you've been playing this way for years, but hopefully we're going to set you straight, and it's just going to be a little bit of a stream of consciousness, so we don't have a super... Um, <laughs> explicit list of things, but I think both Jaden and I both um, peruse the uh, Dune Board Game Geek forums, and, and Jade is pretty active on the Dune Tabletop Discord, which uh, they got a lot, always new players coming in, and I'm sure there's plenty of questions that pop up, and you see the same questions uh, over and over again, probably about every four weeks, <laughs> there's a new cycle of people asking the same questions, and it it happens on Board Game Geek as well. People will they don't bother to search the forums to see which four other people have already asked this sp exact question, and they'll post it again. Sometimes they'll they, they'll they'll read it. I guess we'll never really know if people are searching for their answers and then getting them and not posting about it, but they certainly post about it a lot. So. I think a video where we can cover some things will hopefully help that situation out a little bit. Um, what do you think, what, what would you say are probably like the top three things that get asked the most um, over and over again? Oof. Well, I mean, advisors are always going to be a yeah. source of confusion, I, I inevitably. Five questions just today. <laughs> on advisors. And, you know, the funny thing is about advisors in particular is you've got the way that people have always understood they worked in the Avalon Hill edition. Then you've got the implementation in Gale Force 9, which is not exactly the same because they don't really use the same concept of coexistence with the two states of the tokens. And then you've got the FAQ, which you know there was a there was sort of an early FAQ and then there was a much later longer FAQ, and in none of those four circumstances is it a hundred percent consistent, not even like seventy percent consistent, and um, there has been a new FAQ it hasn't been published yet, but it has been um, written up and submitted to Gale Force Nine, that again tr it tries to clear that up and make it more simple. Um, at the end of the day, I think that the faction sheet itself needs to be rewritten to make it a little bit easier to understand, to try to be more consistent with how things um, are supposed to be according to some of the design intent. And some of that is uh, split up between future pastimes, the original three designers, and then what Av Avalon Hill their team contributed as well. So that's not, not everything is in perfect alignment, but that is definitely the most commonly asked question. And it's never like a one and done. There's always going to be follow-up questions. Well, well, what about this situation? Or what about here? Or like, you have no tokens there and da-da-da-da. So yeah, that's a good call. Advisors is definitely the top one. Um, what else? Half that FAQ is about advisors, and uh, it is, and it doesn't. Half, yeah, it doesn't. some non-zero amount of that is a little bit misleading too. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I have, I have thoughts, <laughs> I have ideas for how to implement it in a way that I think is easier to understand and uh, easier to play, and probably a more equitable approach, but. Um, but time will tell if, if if we if we come to that. Not necessarily a second edition type approach, but um, absolutely if there if there ever was a second edition, um, that would be at the top of the list of things to say. All right, let's really look at this and figure out a good way to make this easy for people to understand um, and makes for good gameplay. Yeah, one thing that uh, definitely confuses people a lot is the difference between deals and bribes. And uh, this, of course, comes into play when you have Chome. They've got their inflation token, and when the double side is face up, meaning that Chome shirt is doubled, it's got a little line there saying that no bribes can be made. And this is, of course, to prevent Chome fraud. Hey, I'll bribe you all my spice so I can collect that 
sweet four spice and then you bribe it back to me <laughs> yeah so that and... effect prevents it but people always ask can you still make deals yeah says, yeah <clears throat> it, it doesn't help that the the rule book is pretty brief in talking about it and a lot of that is driven by the fact that the original designers did not really make deals and they didn't bribe at all and it's just it just wasn't part of the gameplay for them and when it came time to do the 2019 rule book um, they did bring in um, some people who have been playing it a lot more frequently and recently than they had and were definitely part of the generation of deal making and bribery that I think really adds a lot of value to the game. It really it heightens the diplomacy aspect. It heightens the, the social aspect of the game. It creates a lot of interesting new possibilities. And it, it still feels thematic as well. Um, but just because they, they it was not an area where they had a lot of experience, um, they just didn't have a lot to go on in order to flesh out that section of the rule book. So they, they got the bare minimum in there. Um, uh, but what they did leave out is uh, the common practice of you don't get those bribes immediately. It's not really, that's not explicit in the rule book. It, it comes out of the FAQ that um, the bribe goes in front of the shield. You don't get it until the Mentat pause, um, which is another, it's another thing to help cut down on gaming the system and which, which I think really does detract from the game if you were to collect those bribes immediately um, just with some of the economic factions in the game it's it's just problems waiting to happen so I think it's a good rule but the rule book is not explicit about it and uh, they don't have a whole lot to say about uh, deal making and you know giving examples of here are some great ways to to use bribery or just deals that don't involve bribery at all. Um, you know, a kind of classic example is the uh, Atreides gives the Fremen some uh, spice card prescience in exchange for knowing how far the storm is going. That's a deal. It's a, it's a binding deal, um, and it's a pretty typical uh, one. But, um, you know, with Atreides having access to card information there's a great opportunity for deal making there as well whether or not it involves spice although typically it does but it doesn't have to and um, that is uh, I think a really interesting part of the game uh, and it's one that the original designers are not opposed to so they 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 see the value of it but with the the last published FAQ they they felt like this is really something that should be for advanced play so they recommend you only do it when you're playing with advanced rules but i think that any of the players who have been using <laughs> bribery and deal making for more than a couple of years and certainly those who've been doing it for 10 20 and 30 years would say it should be in basic as well Or do you disagree? <laughs> oh, sorry. I think I cut out a little bit for a minute. Yeah, no. It's, I can't really imagine Dune without bribes. Although I certainly, I can certainly imagine it's a very bloody game if there's no bribes or deals at all. Um, I think I, I remember my first game of Dune. I was playing Fremen and I went to go for a spice bullet and someone came in after me and um, and then they offered like, hey, you want to split it? I'm like, oh, is that like a like a mechanic in the game? You can like agree to split the spice between you or something. It's like, no, nope, no, it's just we'll throw the fight. And then one of us bribes the other half the spice. And it's just mind blown in that moment. Like the thought completely did not occur. Just how much power you have in binding deals. Yeah, I mean, when I when I first started playing it in, in the 80s, uh, we did not make uh, deals, and we didn't do any bribing, and and it's because it wasn't in the rules. It just didn't it didn't occur to us. Um, you know, we were teenagers, so uh, we didn't have that much imagination. Um, at least, you know, we didn't. I'm not saying teenagers don't, but certainly we didn't. 
And uh, it wasn't until much later as I began to play Dune with other groups that I was like, oh, yeah, I guess technically you can do this. There's nothing that says you can't. Uh, but then as I began to play it with the Future Pastimes designers, like when we were working on the first expansion, it was just, there was no deal making, there was no bribing. And by then it had become a much more natural part of my gameplay. And um, even on a couple of occasions where I tried to make a deal with them, they just were not interested. <laughs> like, I was like, why don't we, you know, come in here and throw this fight? I'll give you a couple of spice. They're like, no, let's just <laughs> fight, or I'm not going in there. And, uh, and so I think it really wasn't until. Like Bill, for example, began to play in invitationals and there was just deal making going on all around and bribery at every turn. I'm sure that's how it felt to him. And uh, he was like, OK, I, I, I can see the value that is added with this, with, especially with players who know what they're doing. And, um, you know, everyone's getting something and it's moving things along. It's not bogging the game down, which I think is what they were afraid of. Um, at least in some to make aspect. your head spin sometimes yeah you know especially with people who are like all right this is kind of our standard deal and so they've got some shorthand and they're they're like all right let's do this you know like three peaks for two spice all right i'll take that deal and people are like well what 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 is going on here and, and uh you can do that and they're like yeah yeah absolutely and 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 you should um but you need to be clever about it sometimes. You don't want to just be like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to give – I'm giving away all of the card knowledge for a handful of spice. That's probably not a winning approach uh, for Atreides. You're basically turning off one of your advantages uh, to get a little bit of an income. Um, but now you're just the emperor, and so what's the point of that? <laughs> you know, you gotta you got to take your unique gifts when you can, when you can get them. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, in in one of our invitationals, uh, we had this uh, YouTuber named Orski who plays a lot of Dune Imperium, and in his video, it was like edited down below an hour. It was a five hour game, went ten turns. Uh, in his video, he had this one clip where it's just all of us like talking to each other and like making deals and like no but what about this what about that oh you could throw here so you could block the win and he's just in his face cam looking like completely overwhelmed and it's just <laughs> oh the, the joys of playing dune for the first time <laughs> yeah there is uh that, i mean that's the thing that I, that I talk about a lot especially with new players is just the level of nuance that is in dune that is not necessarily apparent uh, flipping through the rule book. Um, you know, if you watch a playthrough, then you start to get a sense of that. Um, I think when somebody I was teaching the game to, they were like, all right, so wait a minute. If I start my movement in Carthag, I can go three. If I don't, I, I can go one, but uh, John can go two because that's his faction. Um, and then the collection is is two but his is three but S sam is the ixian so he's got this collection he's like i don't think i can i don't think i can play this game anymore and i was like it's it's not that it's not that bad but um you know i i, I understand where you're coming from with that and uh, probably the biggest thing is just the the composition of the treachery deck it's not knowing if you're playing it for the first time you don't know about things like Oh, you can blow up the shield wall, and then the storm is going to kill all my forces. It's stuff like that that I think. Um, oh, great! <laughs> that um, it can throw it can throw people when um, they just have no concept of that sort of thing is in there, especially if they're not really steeped in Dune lore. If you know Dune really well, that's not going to surprise you. It. Yeah, you'd be like, <laughs> well, of course you've got family atomics, and you can blow up the shield wall. Um, you know, I, I should have been planning for that. So um, shame on me. I don't blame the game. Um, so, yeah, it, it, I, mean, I mean, remember the first time uh, that I saw that happen in a game and everybody was cheering that it would that it happened because it was so thematic to the book. Um, but I had no idea that it, it could even be done. So it was uh, it was a little strange, although probably to its credit, that original Avalon Hill one. A big component of the game is that player aid that is, again, in some ways, it's just so clunky 
they like here here's this two-sided player aid and it's just mm-hmm. chock full of details but it explains all of the treachery cards and um and then you know your advanced advantages and a lot of other details on there um so if you want you can just everyone else's advantages yeah. yeah so if if you want you can you can be like all right well while it I've got uh, a minute while you're taking your turn. I'm reading about what other treachery cards could be in the deck. Um, there's certainly that that's always was available to you. It, it was a practice. I, I, I didn't bother reading about the cards I didn't have. I was just focused on the ones that I did have. Um, but if I, yeah, if I'd skipped far enough ahead, I would have been all oh, family tomics. What does that do? And um, yeah, I wouldn't have been quite as surprised, but you know, new players, they don't have these player aids, so they don't have a, a, a cheat sheet about the treachery deck. And so maybe that is a player aid that I need to make for uh, jumping into jumping into Dune. Here is the treachery deck shorthand um, so that you have a sense, you have a sense of how many of these things there are and what other effects are in there. Um, you know, the tradies have got their nice little tracker sheet. Um, but if they don't know what the cards do, then that's not super <laughs> helpful because <laughs> it doesn't have a, a breakdown. Weather control, uh, you know, I don't even know what that might do. I um, <laughs> guess it has to do with the storm, but uh, yeah, in what in what manner. So yeah, I think um, yeah maybe I'll, I'll cook one of those up um, and put the that out I there. Always, when I look at those player references is just how short the abilities are. Like, there's tells you what the ability does and that's it there's no other like in this case or you know trying to explain it yeah it's it's crazy how they managed to fit all six you know faction rules on this on this player aid and it was just i think it's just the expansion and not the expansion but the advanced rules yeah but still i mean explaining bg voice and advisors on a little slip of paper well to be fair they didn't bother explaining the advisors they said check the back of the rule book so it was uh it was still too much even for that uh because uh perfect. yeah but yeah i think um i think one of the other things that new players don't necessarily grok right away is um the full breadth of the how the battle plan works um and by which i mean and let's load up let's load up somebody here let's bring in a harken in and so you got your wheel and people understand the concept of like all right i'm going to put my leader disc you know in there and uh and this is not exactly what the battle wheel looks like in the physical game it doesn't have the plus one plus two and the spice and da 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 this is a great forbidden technology great feature for for tts um but as you're teaching them and you're like all right the idea that i'm i'm using the dial to dial the number of the forces that i'm sacrificing and even if we're you know to keep it to the uh basic rules where that is what that number is it's just your forces that you are uh, willing to throw under the bus just to get a higher number and win the battle Um, but not everybody understands that they're supposed to hold their uh, their weapon and their defense up there and keep it secret even the fact the fact that you're playing any cards at all is technically secret you don't have to give that away certainly not the number of the cards and especially not all right well i'm going to play a weapon and a defense you know you don't say that out loud um you got to be very coy about it so that's not super clear it's a little bit more clear in the movie dune edition because you do have you know these slots that um the rule book does explain yeah you're you've got your weapon slot you put a weapon there defense slot and then you know they goes further on to explain there's some cards that you're going to play in place of that, but it's going into the slot. And so that that is clear. And there, there really aren't slots, per se, in classic Dune. But that you're, that you're holding these up uh, on there uh, is not super clear. But that is what you're supposed to do. And here in TTS, of course, it's a bag. So it's super easy to, uh, to just do it that way. Um, but then when you do get into advance, I mean, never mind the whole notion of how advanced spice dialing works. But if you are spending spice, you're technically supposed to also have that spice. You're supposed to somehow juggle your wheel, 
your leader, your cards, and your spice, and keep all of it secret. <laughs> and then bleh, reveal all of it at once with like, here it is. Here's my whole battle plan. I've got three spice, and I've dialed a six here, and I've got these cards and whatnot. And then let's say we're going to complicate it even more with the notion of, all right, I've got a cheap hero, and maybe I even have a worthless card. And the worthless card is going to be replacing my weapon or my defense, or both if I have two. The cheap hero is replacing the leader disc. And so you're not, because I've seen, I've seen people like, all right, I've got Captain Neffert here and a cheap hero, and I've got this. And I was like, all right, you've, you've gone too far. There's, there's too much going on here. And, um, and also, you know, you've dialed high and I don't see any spice. And yeah, so the, this this could be a lot clearer. It is, you know, in, in basic, it's such a super elegant battle system. The system is great. The strength of your leader plus the number of your forces. Uh, and then this sort of elegant take on rock, paper, and scissors where you're like, all right, I've got projectile weapon, poison defense. What do you have? You have poison weapon. Aha, you are blocked. And you have poison defense. You are not blocked. So I've killed your leader. So that leader doesn't contribute. I mean, it's great. It's brilliant. It's uh, And there's really nothing else quite like it, uh, or at least that does it as well. It gets a little bit fuzzier with advanced. Um, it's slightly less elegant. Um, but just the physical manifestation of this um, could stand to be improved. And I would love to see um, a different take on a battle wheel that, never mind trying to help people calculate uh, spy styling. Let's just help people figure out where to put their cards <laughs> and, <laughs> and and whatnot, you know, and maybe a little extra wheel within the wheel, an extra dial for, for the spice so you can say, all right, I am spending three spice. So I've indicated I don't have to hold the spice in my hand because um, it gets one, it gets unwieldy. And I think new players, um, it's not intuitive. It, they're not going to just figure that out on their own. You have to really show them and, and you have to be explicit with here's how you do this and here's how it works. And yeah, it's a little bit clunky. Um, but, you, know, you flip over the battle wheel and then, you know, the other cards are now seen. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's going to trip up new players uh, unless they've been properly instructed on how to logistically organize <laughs> their battle plans and then reveal them yeah, the proper way it's tough i do often notice when playing um dune conquest which is what usually gets played in person over classic is that um the first instinct is just put it flat on the table and start putting stuff on like in full view and then put the leader face down and the cards face down it's like you know if i really want to i can just look at what you're doing you gotta hide that man yes <laughs> It's um it's like every bit of information counts. Yeah, it it really is and um especially when you've got things like the voice and prescience and uh, you're factoring that into all of the gameplay as well and and how that works. Um I think the the other thing that the battle plan area uh is not super clear is this notion of information or, or stuff like truth trance, even um, while you're making your battle plans, like a lot of people get confused on on the prescience. They 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 believe that the way it's supposed to work is the Atreides opponent makes their battle plan, sets it down, and then that's it. They're like, there it is, and then the Atreides goes, "All right, I want to know what the weapon is," and you know they're 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 committed now. They're they're stuck with it, and that's not really how it works out. Um, there is, you know, once you've heard what the prescience is, um, that's when you're actually making your battle plan as their opponent. You're like, I want to know what the, you know, what the defense is, because um, you might have been like, great, you know, I'm 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 planning to use fade. I got to get that six in there. But now that I've heard what what's my defense. My takeaway is probably going to be, well, you have a poison weapon and you and you have a projectile weapon. And you're trying to decide which one to use, um, which is uh, pretty understandable. Um, that that's 
kind of the strength of prescience is I want to know your defense so I know which weapon to use to kill you. But if I think, all right, this is probably mean, means that this leader is going to die, um, I don't necessarily want to put my best leader out there. I mean, it could be a bluff, absolutely. But usually it's not. Usually it's like, I've got two different weapons. Which one should I use? And I was like, well, I wish you would use the poison weapon because I'm playing a poison defense. And I'm like, well, you know, I hate to disappoint you. So you're like, well, then you know what? I'm not going to use fade. And so you're not locked into that as the Harkonnen. You're not like, well, that's, you know, my battle plan is done. And he asked me this thing. So you're like, maybe I'll hedge my bets and I'll use Piter. Um, so if you were lying, then I'm at least adding three, you know, rather than a one or a two with my weaker leaders. Um, but if you weren't lying, then you're only going to get three spice if you win this battle for killing him. Um, and, you know, maybe I need to dial higher if I think that Fade is going to die and I still want to win the battle. Um, so, yeah, that that's not abundantly clear. Uh, and, and there are a couple of other effects that, that work kind of the same way. You're not completely locked into um, the full battle plan per se. Uh, when when these kinds of effects happen, if somebody is going to Karama the Emperor's Sardaukar, um, you know, you have to do that before the battle plans are completed so that the Emperor can have a proper dial, um, you know, and and again, if you're like, oh, I don't have a Sardaukar, so I, I really have to kind of adjust how things are going to work. Um, and it's like, you know, if, if you're going to Karama the Fremen, movement they get to move two territories and you're like great i mean i'm gonna go into habanya siege from false wall west um and somebody is karaming me it doesn't mean that they're oh we're stuck in habanya ridge flat we didn't get to get as far as we want the fremen player does get to reconsider their entire movement action altogether they can be like well in that case i'm gonna move these guys from Tabor over to rock outcroppings and maybe fight for spice um so it, it's the, the, the it's great examples of nuances of the game, um, and it's not the sort of thing that is explicitly stated in the rule books. So, hopefully, players will understand um, more and more that that is the spirit of the game. It's those sorts of things that you're not. It's not about uh, trapping you. Um, it's more about all right. We're having an effect on advantages or on certain elements of the gameplay. Um, and you have a limited uh, ability to adjust to it, um, but it is, it is it is almost certainly still a setback <laughs> in what you were planning to do uh, in the first place. Yeah, one of my favorite uh, lesser known, I mean, not lesser known, but commonly overlooked rules is that the Imperial Basin is actually protected from the storm and becomes vulnerable when you use family atomics. Yeah. And... Of course, in perfect Dune fashion, it's indicated by a barely visible little dotted line. And yeah. it's actually cool when, when you look at the territories, um, the bordering and the line work actually does have a lot of indications about what the territory, what features it has. Like all the sand territories just have a simple bold line. Um, but anything that's protected from the storm has got like a second layer thin line. So you notice like the rock territories have that and the strongholds have that. And then Erikine and Carthag, their kind of storm protection line is dotted, perhaps to indicate that it could go away. And then, of course, the strongholds have got like a thicker kind of highlight to it. A lot of, lot, lot of thought went into the board, which you got you to gotta give credit where it's uh, due for that because... It's pretty, but it's also very functional. Yeah. It doesn't have this handy yellow line here for the Fremen's uh, shipment area. That's something that I'm hoping that the Kwisatz Haderach edition will provide. If they do a bigger board or a new play mat or something like that, that they'll give this nice visual cue for, all right, where, where can the Fremen appear on the board as their shipment action. And it is anywhere inside on the sort of great flat side of that yellow line. My play mat has a, has a nice little dotted doot, 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 along those territories, which it, it really does help. And then some people have like a, a handy reference card, but 
having it right here on the board is so much better. So that is a little bit of bling that I think a lot of people will appreciate uh, if they get on there. But yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. You're, you're right. It's nice that they mark the exact sector where the spice blows are going to be. They even tell you how much it's going to be. Um, although I think that if we, uh, if we ever get a chance to do double spice blow cards like they have in Dune Conquest, um, the numbers might need to be adjusted. Um, it's something worth looking at, but, uh, like, I don't know that they necessarily needed the numbers since it is on the spice cards as well. Um, you know, all right. It's good to be able to look at the board and Eight know spice. a fresh <clears throat> spice blow is what it says next door instead of having to count those darn tokens. Yeah, exactly. That is true. And then another neat rule that's uh, nicely laid on the board is uh, the whole collection and ornithopters and uh, the carry-ons. So, like, it took me surprisingly long time to realize that these three spice symbols here aren't just there for no reason, but they actually tell you that you collect three spice uh, if you control Eric Keen. Yeah. yeah. You've also got the two spice, that's your tax, and then you got the little ornithops to tell you that you can move three territories. Yeah, there are some handy references on there. Uh, you've got the cave to let you know it's not a city, it's a cave. <laughs> We've got the New York skyline in Erkeen and Carthag. So <laughs> tell these are cities. Just yeah. as important as sieges, apparently. But hey. I think another thing that is worth mentioning to people is um, storm order. And where the storm is matters a lot. So if we look at this right here, we see the storm is on this sector right here, and we see that we've got the Harkonnen player token, the faction token, is right there. With this situation, what this is going to mean is that the Harkonnens are first in storm order. So if this were a six-player game and we had faction markers on all of these other circles, the storm, the play order would continue from the Harkonnen. So this player here would be the next player in storm order, and that would matter for you know, for shipping and movement. You know, this Harkonnen would have to ship and move first. Then this player would do their shipping and movement uh, as well. But the storm is right there. Uh, that means actually the Harkonnen is last. So the idea is that it's whichever faction token the storm would get to first. That's your first one in storm order. Um, if they're already there, they wouldn't. It's, they're not gonna get there. They're already there, so you're last. If the storm is covering your token, you are last in storm order. And I and, like to look at it like uh, this arrow here is the starting point. The yeah. Arrow is after Harkonnen, so they are last. That's pretty good. And you don't. If you've got the 3D storm token, there won't be an arrow. But the, the actual. Uh, Punchboard token does have that on there. Um, what changes up a little bit is when you're at the bidding round. And it only changes up in terms of the next card up for auction. So you can have a certain number of cards up. Let's say that we've got three cards that are going to be up for bid. And we'll say that the storm is here. So Harkonnen is going to open first, but they're only going to do that on the first card that's up for auction. After that card is bid, the next card is going to start with the next player in storm order, but only if that player is able to bid. And uh, so you've got a couple of different ways that that will play out. So let's say that at the start of the bidding phase, this player here is already full. They've got four cards. And uh, so they're not going to open on any cards because they're not bidding at all. Uh, the Harkonnen will bid first, and then we would skip over this person and go to the next player who started the bidding round uh, without a full hand, provided that their hand is not full now. So if this, this third player here didn't have a full hand uh, when we got to the second card, they would open on the second card, provided this one 
did have a full hand. But let's say that they bought the first card, right? And it became their fourth treachery card. So now they do have a full hand. Well, what's going to happen is we're going to skip over them and this person would open on the second card. They would also open on the third card. So the idea here is that it would have been this person opening on the second card, except they filled up their hand. So we go to them and we say, no, they can't bid, so we're going to go here. But this person was always going to be bidding on the third card. So um, it's kind of a weird rule. And the rule book, <laughs> to the best of my knowledge, is not really crystal clear on how that plays out. Um, so uh, the idea is that, you know, theoretically, um, if these were the only three people who could have bid when the game, you know, when the round started, or the phase really, um, everybody was going to get a chance to open on a card. Um, so that's that's what you're starting from. Um, and but somebody's going to get to open up twice, and it's going to be this person because they were supposed to open on the third card anyway. Um, I'm sure that that probably is is not only maybe 20% clearer <laughs> than it was before, but that's how it plays out. You know, when you've got other things like the Rich S uh, faction in there, that's going to bring a little bit of havoc to how this un unfolds because you know, the, each card that they sell is replacing another card, and they've got some of the other kooky auctions that they can do. Um, so that will have an impact, but uh, I don't think we need to go into it in this video since it's a little bit outside of your normal basic uh, understanding of the game. Sometimes it almost feels like you needed another person just to run the bidding phase. Yeah, that helps. And again, in you know, in TTS we do have um, <laughs> absolute godsend. Yeah, this thing here. You know, so if we actually do bring in another faction, so we say great. You click, you click next, or if you say, like, oh, no, I'm, I'm making my bid. So everyone can see, all right, the Harkonnens are bidding three. Goes over to Chome, who's the next eligible bidder. And uh, they're like, I'm, I'll bid one. And then it goes right back. So they can be like, all right, nope, you've won. Um, and that's how it you works. Know, there's so many Atreides tracker apps that I think someone honestly needs to make a bidding app. Right? You can all get it on your phone, and then it hooks up to everyone and you could just enter your bids on your phone and it tells you when it comes to you and who's got the highest card and and whatnot i mean that that could be kind of huge honestly yeah i'm sure the great convention would frown upon it but i think you know mm. for purposes of gameplay you should get some of that intelligence in there um there's another thing about uh bidding that i was reminded of and it was the um the notion of passing it's important that players understand and uh let's bring in one more faction here just to uh if i can pick this up yeah no it's giving me these errors but um so we say great you know chome is has bid four and it goes to the emperor and the emperor is like i you know i'm gonna pass on this uh and the harkonnen say oh we'll bid five and it goes to Chome, and Chome is like, well, five's too much too much for us. goes back to the emperor. The emperor passed before, but he is not out of the bidding. Um, he can jump back in, and he can say, oh, we don't want the Harkonnen to get it because they're going to get two cards, so I will bid six. And so what happens is you, you do that until the bid comes back to you. That's when you know that you have won the bid. You were the last bidder, and everybody passed, and it gets back to you and you got the high bid, you pay what you bid, and you get the card. Um, and that is something that a lot of people don't fully understand. And the rules do say that, but it's just it's just the sort of thing that I think there's so many bidding games now, so many auction games out there, and it's not normal for you to be able to get back into bidding. That is not the default state, I think, for a lot of bidding game certainly none of the other bidding games that i have um when you pass uh you're usually you're done on whatever it is you're bidding on one pass and that's all it takes um but in dune uh you can get back in if, if it hasn't gone all the way past you back to the last person who did bid so 
Um, keep it's that a in bit mind. Counterintuitive from a new player uh, perspective. It's like, well, why would I pass on a card that I want to buy? Yeah. Well, sometimes you want to see what other people are going to do first. Exactly, especially with the tradies. And tradies, they know what this card is. That's up for bid. So sometimes you want to wait to see what they bid. And if it's bid's gotten up to four, it gets to a tradies, and they bid five. Well, either that's a really good card or Trades is playing everybody and getting them to bid way too much for something that's not worth it. Um, but it might just be the bit of information that you think you need um, to make a good decision. You just have to worry about if you if you pass on it and the Trades passes on it as well, um, and then whoever was the last bid it gets back to them. Um, maybe a trade he's passed on it because they already have it or they just can't afford it. <laughs> and uh, so you might have you might have missed out. Maybe you need to bribe them, make a deal and say, look, uh, don't let this get by me. I need to get a, a card um, that will help me kill your leader later on. I don't know. I don't know that I would phrase it that way, but, um, you know, a good trade player will read between the lines. Um, so, yeah, that that is something that I think. Uh, doesn't have a huge impact, and I think with players who have played that wrong, um, they're, they're certainly getting a lesser experience. But it's—I it's, don't think it's game breaking. They're like, oh yeah, we once we pass, you're out. Um, uh, fix it. I, I would recommend that you start playing it correctly if you have been doing it wrong. But it's, there are worse things that you could be doing wrong in the game. Um, it would definitely make the bids faster. That's true. The bidding phase is one of the things. It's bidding, shipping, and movement. Those are your two long ones. Battle sometimes can go for a little bit uh, as a while, but there's usually there's a lot of, especially once there are alliances, shipping and movement phase gets longer as people are trying to plot out what they want to do, and sometimes it means they're having uh, some secret communications. And that's something else that's worth that's worth mentioning. You are allowed to have some secret communications with your ally, you you have to let everybody know that you're doing it, but what you're discussing can be completely secret. So, you you know, we physically get up and leave the room. And they're like, all right, I, and I'll take a picture of the game board. <laughs> I feel like I want to be able to point to the uh, territories where uh, we're going to attack you guys and um, not have you know until it's too late. Um, but, you know, it, it's good to ha try to put a time limit on it. I know that the... At the at the tournaments, they have uh, they have a whole thing. You know, at the beginning of this phase, there's a two minute timeout, so everybody can go off and have their little conversations. And then they have uh, tokens that you can spend if you need a little bit extra time. Like, oh, now it's my turn to do my shipping and movement action. But you know, three other factions have gone, and what I wanted to do is no longer even available to me. And so you do want to converse with your ally and go, should we do something else instead? Should we go after spice? Should we you know, he's got eight forces there. Do we send more in and just go for it? So they, it's a good system for them. You spend the token to uh, get a little extra time to go meet. Um, you know, when we play in Tabletop Simulator, of course, we're just sending each other secret messages. Uh, but you can tell that there's messages going on there. And I, I like to also go out of my way and say things like, I'm sending you a message now, so <laughs> make sure you read it. And um, Or use Discord. But the same thing, you got to let people know. That you're doing it, you can't can't covertly um, have communications going on without people knowing that they're happening. Uh, they just don't get to know the details of what it is you're planning. One of my favorite stories of a Dune game. I know what you're going to say, uh, and it's a good yeah, one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's um, two players allied together, and they both happen to be Greek, and no one else at the table was. And so, like, oh, can we just talk? Greek, you know, it's moving to another channel. Um, and yeah, sure, why not? So so they're chatting and um wait a minute, did he just say last gun shield explosion? <laughs> <laughs> In the middle of a sentence. I'm like, wait a minute, I think I understood one of those words. Yeah. And um and then we of course pestered them what a last gun would be called in Greek. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that one. Yeah. Uh, and that would have been a great uh trick to play on everybody as well if you could have uh I don't know if it occurred to them to try to just throw everybody off by oh, slipping yeah. in uh, deceptive English words. So, yeah, yeah. that would, uh, well, The classic uh, joke on TTS is to accidentally mess up the whisper command 
um, but do it, do it on purpose rather. It's like, oh, oh, I have the last gun. Oh shoot! Damn it! I used the backslash. Oh no! Yeah, yeah, I've done that one myself a couple of times. <laughs> so it's you gotta uh, do it at least once. Yeah, life is not complete until that happens. <laughs> it feels very on brand for Dune. Um, so yeah, I think that um, those are a lot of the major the major things. Is there anything else? You know, we got a we got a little bit more time, but um, I certainly well, want to well, you know. You know what? Tell me. Is uh, this is a classic one? Is how does the voice affect the um, weirding way and chemistry? Sure, let's. People uh, are always always talking about that one. So let's get some of those cards out here. I think here we go. So these are cards from Expansion One, and we designed them so that we could have the right ratio of weapons and defenses but we didn't want to just have you know eight shields and eight poison snoopers and stuff like that in the game so you have weirding way which is uh, a weapon by default it's a projectile weapon but you can play another weapon in the battle plan with it and if you do then it becomes a projectile defense and so this is a card that will change and the Defense, uh, the analogous version of that here is chemistry, which is a poison defense by default, but you can play another defense with it, and if you do, it becomes a poison weapon. So that's how that works. So, Jada, why don't you explain, uh, give us some voice examples, and we'll uh, we'll game that out right here. Well, the classic is going to be do not play a tile weapon. A projectile weapon. So if that's the case, if somebody says do not play a projectile weapon and you have got Weirding Way, uh, if you want to play Weirding Way in your battle plan, you'd have to play another weapon with it. Um, and so because this would be a projectile weapon without another weapon in there. So if let's say that your original plan was to play Weirding Way with the snooper. So you've got a projectile weapon and a poison defense. But you've been voiced. Do not play a projectile weapon. So you can still play Weirding Way with a poison weapon. And now this is a projectile defense. So it doesn't prevent you from playing Weirding Way. Now it should be in the current version of the voice. And I say current version. Don't don't read too much into that yet. But um, they can say, do not play Weirding Way. Because it is a special. And they can target it specifically if they so choose. Um, so in that case, if they say, do not play Weirding Way, or, or if they say, you must play Weirding Way, uh, you have to comply with that if you are able to. And maybe you've got other options if, if that's what happens, but um, usually if they're specifying it, it's because they know that you have it and they're they're trying to work around whatever it is that you were planning to do. So same thing with chemistry. If they say, do not play a poison weapon, can't play chemistry with any defense because then chemistry would count as a poison weapon. Um, if they say don't play a poison defense, you could play chemistry with a projectile weapon or sorry, projectile defense. I don't know if we have one somewhere. But anyway, you get the idea. Uh, a shield um, that lets you play chemistry as a poison weapon. So they, their state can change. Um, but the voice will have uh, an effect on it depending on how you choose to implement it. So I think that I think that's pretty clear. Um, yeah, the best way that I've come to think about it is that they both have primary uh, types and a secondary type. So the weirding way is primarily a projectile weapon, but it can secondarily be a projectile defense. And the way that uh, negative voice, which is do not play X, works is that as long as the card isn't of the type that is specified, uh, you're good to play it. Like if there's uh, if it's no poison weapon, you can play chemistry as long as you don't have another defense. And same thing with weirdy way. Now, of course, the confusion always comes in when you're looking at positive voice, where you say you must play X. And the way that works is that you can never be compelled to play Weirding Way or Chemistry as their secondary type. Yeah. So if the voice was, you must play projectile defense, you are not obligated to play it with another weapon. However, of course, you still can if you want to. Um, and then if they do 
you must play projectile weapon, for example, in the case of Weirding Way, well, you got to use it, and uh, you can't play another weapon unless it's also a projectile weapon to change it to a defense. Exactly. So yeah, they say you must play a projectile weapon unless you happen to have, you know, a slip tip or something else, then Weirding Way is affected, does have to go in there. Same thing here. If they say you must play a poison defense, if you don't also happen to have a snooper, then you must use chemistry. You can't decide to change it into something else to get out of the voice completely. Um, but if you did have, say, you must play a poison defense and you have the snooper, um, this, is, this is your compliance right here, and now you're using chemistry as a weapon, which um, good for you. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's a fun thing to kill people with. Kill them with chemistry. <laughs> yeah, never see that coming. Exactly. You go and you add sugar to your coffee and it reacts with a reagent and a bunch of poison gas comes out or something. I don't know. <laughs> Which could be cool for a, some sort of plot point. Yeah. So if you have questions about any of the stuff that we've talked about, then we have failed. Um, but no, feel free to ask them and hopefully we can clarify them further uh, in the comment section. And if there is a sp some specific topics that you would like to see the battle language uh, languagers language, then uh, let us know in the comments as well. Um, I think we're going to try to gather enough people together. There, well, there are specific people who wanted to have a discussion about Dune 2. So we are going to have a battle language about Dune 2 uh, very soon. Uh, hopefully uh, the next time we gather the knives here, we can, uh, we can do that. Um, but we do have a bunch of other stuff. We, we are going to get back into some of these other factions and talk some, uh, or do some roundtable discussion on playing those factions and, um, and whatever else that you guys want us to talk about. Let us know. Um, that is going to be it for this episode of Battle Language. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again soon.